Um, all right, we are going to get started. Um, we are tracking down Ralph, who uh, is awesome, and we would definitely like to hear from. Um, but we are going to get started because I know we have a busy afternoon ahead of us. Um, this is uh, this is panel six out of seven workforce. Um, this is the time when it's like the old Jerry Lewis telethons. This is where like the ties start to come off. <laughs> Yeah, we're all giving away our ages. Anyway, this is going to be a really great discussion about workforce. We've talked a lot about technologies. We've talked a lot about implementation. This panel is going to be all about the people who actually do all of the hard work. Speaking of doing the hard work, we are very fortunate to be joined via video remarks by Senator Chris Van Hollen. Senator Van Hollen is the uh, vice co-chair of the uh, Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. And so my colleague Dan O oh is going to bring up his video, and we'll hear from Senator Van Hollen, and then we'll get started with the rest of our panel. Thank you, Dano. Hi, I'm Chris Van Hollen, and I'm proud to represent the great state of Maryland in the United States Senate. And it's my pleasure to join you for another Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. I'm especially pleased to join this year's event because it coincides with the 40th anniversary of the birth of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Back in 1984, a bipartisan group of members of Congress helped launch the EESI, recognizing that everybody has a stake in a clean energy future. In the years since, you have showcased pioneering researchers, key policymakers, and entrepreneurs who are developing innovative new clean energy technologies. I've been proud to work with the EESI during my time in Congress including serving as co-chair of the House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus during a period of time when I was in the House. Today, we face a critical moment in our effort to confront the climate crisis. Like elsewhere around the world, my home state of Maryland is experiencing the harsh impacts of climate change every day. The coastal communities along the Chesapeake Bay and the Eastern Shore are facing major costly tidal floods, and big swaths of Western Maryland are on the verge of extreme drought. The costs of inaction are apparent and rising, but the benefits of action in the form of new technologies, energy cost savings, and good paying jobs are even bigger if we seize on those possibilities. And I salute all of you for being part of that mission. Together we made history with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, the largest single investment ever made in our fight to deploy more clean energy to address the climate crisis. I was especially proud to incorporate into that bill two measures I've been working on for years. The first was based on a bill I first introduced back in 2009 to establish a national green bank to leverage more private capital for clean energy projects. After years of working to advance this proposal, I teamed up with Senator Markey to create the $27 billion Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. These funds will serve as a force multiplier for private investment in clean energy projects to cut greenhouse gas emissions, advance environmental justice, and create clean energy jobs. I was also glad the IRA had another measure I had worked on with former Congressman, now Senator, Peter Welch, to make homes more energy efficient, which is a win-win-win for reducing energy demand, cutting costs for American families, and supporting over 2 million people in the energy efficiency workforce. Our Hope for Homes provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act provide rebates to homeowners who make energy efficient upgrades, like insulation, heat pumps, and HVAC systems and funds training and certification programs for residential energy efficiency contractors. These measures create high quality, good paying jobs and reduce stress on the electrical grid. These two initiatives, the Greenhouse Reduction, Gas Reduction Fund and Hope for Homes are finally in the process of being implemented. And I hope the financial incentives and benefits they provide will help boost your efforts. Beyond those measures, the IRA included a host of other important provisions, including critical incentives for offshore wind manufacturing and production, 
and I've been partnering closely with the Biden administration to ensure we can unleash the full potential of offshore wind in the central Atlantic. One of the most impressive success stories is underway outside of Baltimore at the site of the former Bethlehem steel plant. Once the largest steel manufacturing plant in the world, that factory closed its doors in 2003. Now, U.S. Wind is building Sparrows Point Steel on a piece of that land, a new facility that will fabricate wind turbines and create great jobs. These are just a few of the initiatives that we've been able to undertake in the past few years under the Biden-Harris administration. Of course, these successes didn't come out of nowhere. Organizations like EESI and people like all of you have provided critical research and engaged to help lay the foundation for that change. It will make a difference for decades to come. We still, of course, have much more work to do, and we're counting on you for that, too. Thanks for all you do. Thank you to Senator Van Hollen for doing that. That was really nice of him. Uh, great staff also to work with. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, he's had his, he's had a, a part in a lot of those big uh, programs that were part of the Inflation Reduction Act. So very cool. So thank you. And thank you, Dano, for making that work. Um, we're going to dig into our panel now and start talking about some workforce issues. So our first panelist uh, will be Dennis Knight. Uh, Dennis is the president of ASHRAE. Dennis, welcome to our panel today. I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> and thank you to the EESI for the opportunity to speak on these uh, important discussions today. As president of ASHRAE, I'm honored to represent our organization and the HVAC in our industry um, and share our perspective on workforce and some of the challenges and opportunities uh, in both HVAC and R and the building science industry. Um, ASHRAE was founded in 1894. We're 130 years old this year. Uh, we're a global society of about 55,000 uh, engineers, contractors, building owners, um, technicians that are advancing human well-being through sustainable technology for the built environment. Um, our focus spans on building systems, so the things that make this building work for all of us here today. Um, and energy efficiency, uh, which, which allows us to then build smaller power plants and smaller grids to support the energy needs we need, uh, indoor air quality, and, and of course sustainability. And we write, uh, we, we sponsor research, uh, we publish standards, one of the most notable ones you might be familiar with is 90.1, which is our national energy code, essentially. Um, we publish and we do continuing education to shape today's, to shape tomorrow's built environment today. Now, I began about two years ago as president of ASHRAE, I get the privilege of setting the theme for the year that I'm president. And uh, um, my, my theme was empowering our workforce, building a sustainable future. Um, workforce development's been really important to me uh, through the years. I started as a plumber. Uh, putting cast iron pipe in, in red clay ditches and then went on to be a draftsman. Uh, got a degree in physics, became an engineer, and ultimately after 45 years became president of ASHRAE. Um, and, um, but our industry and all of our industries, we're, we're facing a, a, a critical issue and we're facing a crisis, I think, and that is with our workforce. We've got a, we're witnessing a broadening skills gap uh, due to worker retirement. Uh, technological advances requiring new skills and increased global competition and a lack of emphasis on technical education. We, we've, we've got to move beyond the point where jobs in the buildings industry, the construction industry, the manufacturing industry are jobs of last resort. We have, uh, my whole theme is changing the way we talk about our workforce any industry that's been represented here today, uh, you can find family sustaining, upwardly mobile career paths. And um, that will have an impact, will help us solve the climate crisis, and generate economic viability for our country and the world. So a few things real quick that ASHRAE is doing to address some of these challenges are, uh, we've heard about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, 
Several years ago, we, we established a DEI subcommittee of our board of directors uh, that develops policies and, and creates educational pro programs and, and resources to not just our board, but all 55,000 members, our regions around the world. Uh, we've created training videos on the topic, as such as implicit bias, uh, microaggressions, and inclusive leadership. Um, we create partnerships. Um, we have memorandums of understanding with over 70 different organizations on the planet right now, uh, and two of which uh, um, are uh, the National, uh, uh, the Women in HVACR, and uh, the National Society of Black Engineers. And uh, we are focused, we believe that a diverse workforce, again, as I said, anybody can make a, a, a career in this industry and make it rewarding and have an impact. Um, and uh, I think Jenny Rometty said it best, former CEO of IBM, when, when she said, uh, aptitude, aptitude is not determined by zip code. Everybody on the planet can make a difference, have an impact, and create a, a career in any, any of the industries that are represented here today. Now, for workforce development, uh, specifically, we advocate for policies that support students and universities, community colleges, uh, career technical education programs that prepare them for careers in HVAC and R, technicians, building scientists, um, and we do part, you know, really support the bipartisan freedom uh, uh, to invest in tomorrow's Workforce Act, uh, which would expand qualified expenses under 529 plans to be basically career development plans rather than just education. Um, we provide, uh, we, we develop and we provide training certifications. Uh, our Resilient and Efficient Codes Implementation, which is a project funded by DOE, uh, grant aims to uh, increase energy code enforcement activities and connect disadvantaged communities to career opportunities. We also offer certification programs recognized by the DOE that meet the Better Buildings Workforce Guidelines. So as we look to the future, ASHRAE is committed to supporting legislation and policies that benefit workforce development in HVAC and R and the broader engineering, contractor, and facility maintenance communities. Um, we're eager to collaborate with policymakers and our industry partners um, to address these critical workforce challenges and uh, just happy to be here and be part of the conversation. Thank you. Well, we're really happy to have you, Dennis. And you talked about your career trajectory, but don't you, to become president of ASHRAE, don't you first have to be treasurer and vice president of ASHRAE? I do, and that's, that's, yes. that's, that's the time when I get to develop that yes. team. So I have some really great people on my treasurer's advisory committee, my president-elect advisory committee that work with me. When I said workforce development, Yes, you're part of the said, workforce. And they said, yeah, you know, that's not sexy. It's not going to be appealing to anybody. And, I said, I believe it can be. Yeah. There's like a, work, there's like a training wheels program for ASHRAE leadership where they get to That's walk right. and then they get to run and then they get to sprint. So. Sure. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Um, um, unfortunately, um, Ralph Cleveland is not going to be able to join us today. He sends his regrets. We just found out. Um, if you haven't familiarized yourself with Ralph or his organization, the American Association of Blacks and Energy, I really encourage it. Uh, they're a very diverse group. Uh, among uh, lots of engineers and, and utility workers and people in the energy space. Um, Abe is a great resource uh, and um, they're a great partner of ours. Um, Ralph was a panelist at last year's expo and uh, on a different panel actually um, and um, he's a, a great speaker. If you have a chance to check him out or their conferences, I encourage you to do that. So plug for Abe, unfortunately Ralph won't be able to join us today. but. Um, we'll have a little bit more time for our own conversation, um, uh, and that brings us to um, Pamela Rogers-Klein. Pamela is Executive Vice President, Corporate Relations and Sustainability at Whirlpool, and part of the team that set up maybe the most impressive exhibit in the exhibition oh, space. Yes. It's pretty cool. Pam, over to you. Wow. Thanks for the advertisement, um, and thank you, Dan, sincerely to you and the EESI organizers for the opportunity to, to join the panel today. Um, you know, Whirlpool Corporation is not as old as ASHRAE, but we were founded in 1911. So uh, a long history, and we are actually the last remaining US-based appliance company. 
among major competitors. So we've been in business now almost 113 years, and we really do have a very strong commitment to the domestic manufacturing and marketplace. We have some of the most recognizable, best-in-class brands. We have not only our Whirlpool brand, but also Maytag, Amana, Jenier, and KitchenAid that are within our house of brands. And we proudly operate 10 factories within the U.S. spread across six states. So we have 19,000 people uh, as part of our U.S. workforce, 14,000 of which are in those factories. So workforce development and ongoing um, workforce education is incredibly important to us, and these can be great jobs. Not everyone is destined for college, but we've got some great opportunities here. So apprenticeship programs, that sort of thing, are, are very important to us. Um, and, you know, we're participating in today's event because sustainability is not new for us. It's very foundational. So throughout our long history, it's always been part of how we operate. And if you go back to 1969, our CEO at the time, a gentleman named Elijah Gray, actually wrote in his letter to the shareholders that we cannot separate the business, our business from the communities in which we operate and hope to grow and prosper as a company. And in 1970, he set up the Office of the Environment. So that was groundbreaking at the time. And through that office, set aggressive environmental standards across all of our operations. And this applied not only to the products we make, but also how we make our products and how we treat um, those people in the communities where we operated. So this is not new, um, and we've been a partner throughout uh, the industry with different competitors as well as EPA and DOE over a number of years, really going back to 1987 when the Appliance Standards Program was created. Since that time, appliances have become between 50 and 75 percent more efficient also having larger capacities and features. So to put it in perspective, if the auto industry had been regulated and made the same progress, a minivan would get 63 miles to the gallon and have seven, nine seats instead of seven. So it would be bigger and more efficient. That's what we've done in home appliances. Another fact I always like to share, uh, dishwasher is three to four times more efficient than hand washing. So you can save 2,500 gallons a year using your dishwasher. So use your dishwasher guilt-free. Please. Uh, so we're incredibly proud of the sustainability um, achievements we have made. We have scope three emission reduction targets, which we're well on track for, as well as we are 100% zero waste to landfill across our manufacturing operations globally. As Dan referenced, we do have a display at the Expo of one of our latest and I would say greatest innovations. It's called Slim Tech Insulation. It's for refrigeration. So. I won't bore you with all the details, but refrigerators across the industry for the last 50 years have used polyurethane foam as an insulator. And it's quite a thick insulator. It also cannot be easily recycled. And any materials that it's in contact with stick to this polyurethane foam, and therefore they can't be recycled either, because if you burn the foam, it's toxic and creates other issues. So through proprietary technology, we were able to develop a powder that through a vacuum insulation process creates a much thinner panel. So we will get away from eventually 9 million refrigerators going into landfills each and every year as we're able to expand this technology um, beyond um, just the, high, the very high end right now. This slim tech insulation also allows um, the refrigerator to be either 50% more efficient if it's the same in, uh, thickness as the polyurethane foam, or probably more interesting, honestly, to consumers because refrigerators are already pretty darn energy efficient, by the way, unless you have a 30-year-old one in your garage, and that's another story. But 25% um, more capacity within the footprint that you have. So if you think about the space in your kitchen, that's where your refrigerator sits. It can be 25% larger, and it also provides better temperature control for less food waste as well. So we're incredibly excited about this technology. We put tens of millions of dollars into the development. Um, it will take time to get this across uh, all of our product lines, but please check it out in the expo. And that's just one example of an innovation we're bringing. And that's really what it takes is a step function change in innovation in order to go to the next level on water and energy efficiency without compromising performance. And in order to develop these ideas and design and test them, we need the right workforce and the right facilities. So we continue to invest significantly in the US uh, in our facilities. We just opened uh, last year a new $63 million technology center 
in our home state of Michigan where 400 engineers design and develop washers, dryers, dishwashers in our KitchenAid small appliances. This is a LEED Silver certified building. So despite the fact we're testing product 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we were able to achieve um, LEED certification. So we do have a talented workforce. We're keep working hard to maintain that talent level and to, to recruit new work, workers as well, both within our engineering facilities um, and of course in our manufacturing facilities and keeping environmental um, and social responsibility really top of mind. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Appliances are actually secretly awesome. Not like, so secret. The story of like why, well no, but like, you know, ice right. machine, uh, why we have ice makers and water machines, it's actually pretty cool. Yeah, like, it pretty is. Neat. They have a little bit of a bad rap. People think they still use a lot of water and energy, no, but they don't. they actually so. work out really good. Yep. Um, I love my dishwasher. Um, Great. Next up, we will hear from Sapna Giwala Dalla. Sapna is Associate Vice President of uh, Policy and Research at the Alliance to Save Energy, one of my alma maters. Sapna, so happy to have you on the panel. Uh, there are an awful lot of energy efficiency jobs out there. I'm sure you'll tell us all about them. Yes, we are one of the um, industries that have the most amount of clean energy jobs, uh, but I'll get into that after. Um, Dan, thank you so much for inviting me here, as well as the Alliance. Appreciate it. And the ESI Expo has always been an amazing location to learn so much. Um, so excited to, to be here and participate this year. Um, like Dan said, I'm from the Alliance to Save Energy. We are a bipartisan, fuel neutral energy efficiency organization. We work on federal energy policy. Um, and so we work directly with folks on the Hill as well as our membership at the Alliance to advocate for energy efficiency first. Um, and we are a little bit younger. We were started in 1977 um, where we really wanted to um, expand and ensure that energy efficiency was a part of the policies that were coming out. Um, and our primary focus is federal advocacy. And so we work uh, around federal energy efficiency policy, um, really ensuring that energy efficiency remains at the forefront of our st strategy around energy. The importance of energy efficiency, I know folks have talked about it already um, all day today. Um, and I know you all are advocates, hopefully, around energy efficiency. Um, and I don't need to bring you on board. Um, but we really do see energy efficiency at the Alliance as the nation's most abundant tool and energy resource in our clean energy toolbox. Um, and so it really does represent a significant economic opportunity uh, to really most effectively uh, utilize the technology that we have today before we're even including any other supply side technologies. And so energy efficiency investments have saved the US um, on the consumer and business side over a trillion dollars annually. And so that's money that goes back into homes, goes back into businesses uh, where they're able to help with workers and add you know, additional context and funding towards the work that they're doing. It has also helped to strengthen the grid um, reliability as well as drive our US uh, innovation and economic representation as well. Um, energy efficiency, we've heard from many st uh, studies, but also a very recent study by the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and the Brattle Group back in October, where energy efficiency can help us reach our decarbonization goals for 2050 by 50%. And that is a huge chunk. Um, and so that study really helps us carve out why energy efficiency is important, why we should be investing in, why we should be investing in it, and then why our workforce is going to be very, very important going into the future as we want to get to that clean energy decarbonized uh, realm by 2050. We're going to need people to work on these technologies, work on these policies, um, and really make sure we're getting to that dream goal that we have. The federal focus for the Alliance, of course, is on energy efficiency policy. And so we have three major topics that we uh, work on more, uh, more recently. And so one is, of course, behind the meter energy efficiency. So that's your traditional HVAC in your basement. It's making sure you're cool and comfortable uh, in the summer. It's making sure um, businesses are running. It's making sure you know, energy efficiency technologies are connected where they need to be. We also work on demand side management. And so we're educating and really advocating for policies to reduce energy consumption through that improved energy standards. So whether it's around codes for buildings or standards for appliances, as well as buildings and industrial processes. We also talk about virtual power plants. And so that's our third topic. 
Um, and virtual power plants are really there to help aggregate multiple behind the meter resources, our solar panels, our batteries, our energy efficiency technologies, um, and really make sure that we're able to provide a flexible and reliable responsive grid. Um, this approach, of course, not only improves the where we're going to be putting this energy, but also how we're going to be putting this energy. Um, and it really helps integrate and improve grid reliability overall um, and integrate the renewables at a more affordable uh, and reliable capacity as well. In terms of equity and inclusion, um, equity is big at the Alliance. Um, I myself am very excited to be here to talk about workforce and to make sure that equity is included in that, um, in, in the conversation. And so energy prices have increased uh, tremendously through m multiple different events and really highlighting the need of energy efficiency, especially to help families manage their energy loads and burdens. And so low income and minority uh, communities experience higher um, energy burdens and less funding for their home energy upgrades as well. Energy efficiency can really help those homeowners as well as businesses weather those price increases and then lower those energy burdens within the community overall. The workforce within energy efficiency is also crucial to our nation's future. I mentioned earlier that we have a lot of jobs in energy efficiency. Um, this sector is one of the largest and fastest growing sectors of employment within the energy sector, and we have over 2.1 million jobs, um, and it's only increasing. Um, and so our policy and research team at the Alliance plays a big role in making sure that we're engaging with policymakers here on the Hill, especially with our membership, um, and creating research and conducting research and understanding and really simplifying some of the research that is coming out um, to advocate for legislation that is inclusive of energy efficiency as well as an inclusive workforce overall. We also have, or we talked about the IRA and IIJA funding that has come out as well, and so we've worked um, tirelessly and tirelessly to make sure energy efficiency was a part of that, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund and the Solar for All program, um, but also making sure that workforce is a part of that conversation, because if we don't have the workforce, um, how are we going to get to the goals that we want to get to? Um, the Alliance also has a... Uh, education arm, and so we work with K-12 school districts as well as HBCUs to increase energy efficiency within those sectors, but also give them hands-on experience at an early level to understand better what clean energy uh, related jobs are out there, whether it's energy efficiency, whether it's um, engineering, whether it's communications, just really understanding better what the opportunities are um, within the clean energy sector. Um, and so we're very passionate about this at the Alliance, I myself just in general, um, and are very excited to, to be here and continue to talk about the workforce sector and efficiency. Thank you, Sapna. And you don't have to take Sapna's word for it. You can look at our climate jobs fact sheet that comes out every two years, and there's an awful big slice of the climate jobs pie that are attributable to energy efficiency. So Absolutely. thanks. It's great to have you today. Thank you. Uh, our final panelist of this session is Brees Zuku. Brees is head of business development at Radiant. Also a very cool display in the exhibit space. So I don't want to undersell Radiant because they their setup looks really great. Brees, thanks for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you to uh, the, for the invitation uh, for us to be able to present and talk a little bit about uh, probably a more exciting topic, uh, and that's advanced nuclear uh, within kind of the uh, energy efficiency, uh, renewable energy space uh, today. Uh, so Radiant, what we're doing is we're developing Kaleidos. Uh, Kaleidos is a one megawatt nuclear microreactor. Uh, that's a lot of words there. Uh, but really what we're doing is we're taking what you're seeing as a uh, 1,000 megawatt scale, uh, utility scale reactor, and shrinking it down by a couple orders of magnitude. So you have that same resiliency and power, that same power availability, within the size of a shipping container. One megawatt is enough power for about 1,000 homes. Uh, so that is actually uh, enough to power a village in Alaska. That's enough to power a, a hospital uh, in rural areas, or even start to provide power for disaster relief. So there's a ton of uh, applications uh, for, for this technology. So our philosophy is, is ultimately building the nuclear power that people actually want and that is deployable anywhere around the world. Uh, to do that, we've prioritized safety in our design. 
Uh, so we use uh, what the Department of Energy has termed an accident tolerant fuel. Uh, it's a uranium fuel that's coated in uh, different uh, layers of ceramic. It's about the size of a poppy seed, and there ends up being millions of these inside our nuclear core, and it's called triso fuel. Uh, so triso itself uh, is uh, kind of captures a lot of the, the fission products that happens as uh, the fission reaction uh, kind of propagates inside the core. Uh, but what's important is it gives uh, the, the core a high heat handling capability, about 1,600 degrees Celsius. In our uh, modeling, we are anticipate our core to be no higher than 1,100 degrees Celsius. So effectively, we've eliminated the risk of meltdown with our reactor design. Along with that, we're, we're technically a high temperature gas reactor. Uh, what that means is we use an, a gas to move that heat that's, uh, 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 that's created in the core out of the core to generate power. Uh, almost all power is generated just by either making heat, burning a fuel to make heat, moving that heat around, and transforming it into electrical energy. So we do that through the fission reaction, and then we use helium as a coolant to move that heat. Uh, helium is really important and a very specific safety choice because helium does, doesn't really become radioactive, uh, and it's a gas. It's not a, a liquid or like molten salt uh, or like water, like what is used as a coolant for most utility-scale reactors. Uh, so if you're radiant and you're planning to produce about 100 of these units a year, uh, then you can expect that there's likely going to be an incident at some point. And so with helium, it's a gas that floats out of the atmosphere, and it's non-radioactive material. Uh, so it, again, eliminates the risk of a long-term enduring environmental issue were there ever to be a problem in the field. And lastly, on the safety, we use passive cooling, um, uh, passive cooling elements in our design. Um, what that means is the, the reactor itself cannot continue to increase in temperature because we actually we will reject the heat to ambient air. And uh, unlike utility scale reactors that have active cooling features, they require like triple redundancy on their coolant pumps. Um, and uh, so we've eliminated, again, that risk. So, we really took what, is, what are the major issues, what are the major safety cases uh, for deploying a, a nuclear reactor, and uh, kind of our design addresses a lot of those. Uh, and so we're accelerating quickly towards uh, kind of two major milestones to really commercialize this technology. Uh, the first is a test at Idaho National Lab's dome facility in 2026. Uh, so this is a purpose-built facility. A lot of investment dollars has gone in uh, to Idaho National Lab, specifically the National Reactor Innovation Center, NRIC, uh, to develop this dome. And it's a purpose-built facility to test microreactors in particular. So those are nuclear reactors that are generally meant to be portable or transportable and uh, operate anywhere from kind of one megawatt to, let's say, five megawatts. Uh, and so we, will, we are slated to test in the dome in 2026. That's our, that's our timeline. Uh, to do that, we are uh, regulated by the Department of Energy for that specific test. And so we're already two of the five steps uh, through that regulatory process. Uh, and we've also won what's called a, a feed award through the Department of Energy, uh, which helps uh, us do the design, experimental design for testing actually in the dome itself. Uh, and so we're one of three awardees of these FEED awards, which pretty much gives a per, uh, puts us at the front uh, of the line or really on the frontier of development in this kind of new wave of advanced nuclear. Uh, we're radiant to be the first to test in the dome facility. Uh, it would be the, the first time that a new nuclear reactor design has been tested in the U.S. in the last 50 years. Uh, so it's really a, a kind of... Um, uh, 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 kind of reshoring of this nuclear innovation uh, from uh, kind of exporting to, uh, to foreign nations. Uh, and so along this timeline, we have the challenge of finding a workforce to help design, manufacture, and also maintain these units out in the field. Uh, and you know, to do that, uh, we need very specific skill sets. And in reality, these skill sets have waned over the last 20 plus years in the US, uh, but we have seen coming back. So with projects like the Vogel reactors going online or being developed in Georgia, or even the announcement of the Palisades plant in Michigan 
uh, being reopened, we're seeing a lot more investment in uh, kind of the, the nuclear workforce uh, to have the right licensing uh, and be able to implement these large infrastructure projects. Now, we're not on those large utility scales. We're, again, on this one megawatt scale. But those same skill sets still apply. And, for, and if we don't keep up this pace of developing nuclear reactors, then there is a place for this workforce to go to, and that's with companies like Radiant or others in this smaller advanced nuclear space uh, that can really uh, kind of help uh, kind of manage what we anticipate to be quite a large fleet of, of small nuclear reactors. Uh, and so the nuclear industry has seen um, a lot of focus and attention from Congress recently. Uh, so the Advance Act was just uh, signed into law, uh, as well as other kind of nuclear, uh, the Nuclear Fuel Security Act, as well as part of the NDAA. So there's been a lot of focus uh, on the nuclear industry and making sure uh, that we have the, the support, whether it's from the regulatory perspective and regulatory modernization, um, as well as uh, also on workforce as well. And so we're, we're excited about this new wave and excited to participate and uh, be on the frontier of it. Very cool. Thank you very much. Um, we, Lindsay has a microphone as she has throughout the day. And so we'll definitely be happy to take questions from the audience. Um, one thing I'm thinking about is, um, Dennis, maybe we could start with you and then hear from Pam and Safna and Brees. You know, there are a bunch of college kids on summer vacation right now. There's a bunch of high school kids on summer vacation right now, a lot of elementary school kids on summer vacation right now. Um, but they're eventually going to be working in the workforce. They're going to, many of them hopefully, will be joining the clean energy space, renewable energy space, the energy efficiency space. Um, how are students today at the different, at, you know, high school, elementary, whatever, how are they learning about these opportunities? Are they learning about these opportunities and are there ways that we could maybe start introducing them to what it's like to be part of the clean energy workforce at an earlier point in their education? Thank you, Dan. I really don't think that's, they're part of the conversation. When you talk to guidance counselors, career uh, uh, um, guidance counselors, uh, advisors in, in universities, and that's one of our goals this year is to utilize our network of 200 chapters and 55,000 members and give them this toolkit to go out and start talking about this industry. And, and uh, one of your questions was, what would, would be nice in five years? And, and what would be nice is for our industry, the clean energy industry, the HVAC in our industry, the manufacturing industries, to be on the tip of the tongue and a routine part of the conversation um, as young as um, the K through 12 schools and right on through universities. Uh, to where people understand that these are great jobs uh, that, that can support a family and, and, and be very rewarding in the way we approach solving climate change um, between now and 2050. Um, so, I, yeah, just get it in, in the, as part of the conversation and, and then allow consumers and parents to understand how important we, we're all touched by uh, buildings and indoor air quality and, and energy efficiency every day. And uh, it's really, we are energy, right? So, yeah. Pam, how about you at Whirlpool? How are you reaching students? How are you kind of cultivating this pathway for the clean energy workforce to join companies like Whirlpool? Yeah, there's a few different ways that, that I'll touch on. I mentioned the apprenticeships earlier. One other thing we've done is through our Whirlpool Foundation, rather than just scholarships, for going to college, we're actually funding scholarships for trade programs as well. I mean, that's a, a deep need, and college, again, isn't the solution for everyone, so we wanna make sure we're fostering that. Um, we are partnering with Best Buy to build a Best Buy Teen Tech Center right across from one of our local high schools, and Whirlpool is providing the funding for that. Uh, Best Buy provides the programming. These have had phenomenal success. They're really youth-centered community hubs that introduce teens to the latest technology. They learn about real world careers within the, the technology space and interact with supportive mentors in this space as well. So again, it'll really be accessible to our local kids and I think teach them about things that probably we don't even know about, right? On the leading edge of technology. Uh, we also have a program called the PATH Internship. We put this in place a few years ago. We recognized we had a gap where we would have high school interns and then we would have interns after their um, sophomore and junior year of college. But after their freshman or their senior year in high school and freshman year in college, 
we weren't bringing them in. And this is when they're making their decisions about what their career should be in some cases. And so we're introducing them to what it's like to work at this big company in, in their fairly small town and what those career paths could be. And we always host at least one intern within our environmental sustainability group to make sure they're aware. They have a lot of passion for this. They don't always know what all the careers could be within this space. So we're making sure we're hosting within there as well. And Sapna, you mentioned the K through 12 program that the Alliance has, but it sort of came towards the end. But how are you all at the Alliance trying to, you know, cultivate students into uh, clean energy workers of the future? Yeah, absolutely. So I mentioned we at the Alliance, of course, we're federal policy advocates. We were talking about energy efficiency. We've, you know, made sure within the IRA and the IIJ there is energy efficiency. Um, however, we also have an arm that does education around energy efficiency. And, and that arm uh, works with K-12 school districts and then most recently HBCUs as well, so historically black colleges and universities. And so our Empowered Schools program uh, is an excellent example of kind of how we are reaching students early within the K-12 side of things. And so we are engaging students within energy conservation and energy efficiency um, through programs and training uh, around energy audits and then just competitions within their schools as well um, to, for them to better understand the practical knowledge that goes into these types of conversations and topics, um, really helping to spark that interest hopefully early on. Um, and these experiences, of course, not only educate our students um, about the importance of efficiency, but also hopefully inspire them to take on careers within that space. The HBCU modernization initiative that we have um, also offers fellowships to students that work on campus around energy efficiency projects. And so that helps to also really foster that professional development um, and mentorship within that clean energy sector. Um, and one thing I wanted to add was also how, how can we reach these folks better? How can we reach students earlier? Um, we really need to take advantage of the resources that they're using. And so one of them is, of course, our digital platforms. Um, and so making sure success stories of the types of jobs that are out there within the clean energy sector um, are in front of them in the way that they're going to digest it. And so making sure we're using uh, social media for success stories, career pathway changes, uh, educational resources as well, um, including what we're doing with K-12 and higher education folks, I think is the best way for us to get out the different types of jobs that are out there within the clean energy sector. It's not only engineering, it's not only policy, um, but it can be communications, it can be government affairs, it can be many, many different uh, pathways that folks can take. Um, and I also want to highlight the importance of mentorship um, as well as the visibility of diverse backgrounds. And so yeah, I like to use this story for myself is I've had many, many mentors uh, in my career so far and I hope to have even more uh, going forward and they've really helped me understand what opportunities are out there, shared their networks with me, gave me the opportunity to learn and understand more parts of the clean energy industry. Um, I stuck with energy efficiency, but there's a lot more out there um, that even I still want to learn and understand. Um, and really highlighting that diverse range of careers, I think, is that biggest thing where mentors can really engage with students, um, college students, as well as folks within the early career industry as well. Um, and so that's what I think that we definitely want to make sure we're using social media platforms, we're utilizing our K-12 curriculum, our uh, college level curriculum, uh, but also making those targeted, uh, focused um, outreach programs towards our less diverse um, areas as well. Because some places may or may not have access to internet at all times. Um, so making sure those designated programs are there um, so folks have that equal opportunity to really understand the careers that are in the clean energy sector is important. Thanks, Apna. And Brees, what's this like on the cutting edge for technologies that are, you know, coming together, not quite there yet, but like obviously hold a huge amount of potential? What, what is, what, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, I think uh, in terms of reaching kind of the K to 12 population, uh, Radiant has actually put an investment uh, into the T3 program in Alaska. We see Alaska as this, you know, they call themselves one of the frontier states. And it's really true, especially for nuclear as well. Uh, and so we're looking to likely um, Alaska may receive the, the first uh, unit that we, that we produce. 
And so we've started to make a lot of investments in education uh, in the K through 12 space. We actually just have two uh, of my colleagues uh, travel up to Fairbanks to participate in the program this summer, the T3 program that is. Uh, and so we're already making those uh, investments in, in making sure that people are aware of the, the progress that nuclear has made over you know, the past 20 plus years. Uh, and, and that's, I think, really important because there are still misconceptions uh, about nuclear energy and, and how safe it has become and what an asset it can be to a community. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about you know, electricity, but it is a combined heat, uh, uh, combined uh, cogeneration plant. So you get heat and electricity out. And so for communities in Alaska, you know, what we're looking at is not only providing the electricity, which is a lifeline, uh, but also the heat. About 80% of all of the electricity used during the winter in Alaska is actually used to generate heat. Uh, and so uh, you can actually go and provide a lot more economical uh, heat production because it's already a byproduct of your electricity generation. Uh, it, for a startup, uh, you know, we, all, we do have our internship program, uh, which is uh, one of the ways that you know, we travel to different universities and, and university recruiting to kind of introduce that concept uh, that uh, not only is nuclear, en nuclear industry for nuclear engineers, but we hire for software, mechanical, um, you know, fluids, thermal, uh, you know, electrical, and we obviously do also hire for nuclear engineers as well. Um, even on our operations side of the business, there's a lot that needs to happen to be able to stand up, deploy, maintain, uh, or even develop a factory. Uh, so one of the kind of workforce elements that, that or one of the elements of our factory siting process, uh, which should uh, uh, we're looking to announce where we're going to site our factory this year, uh, one of the factors around decision making is what's the workforce development opportunities, whether that's with local universities. You know, is there a pipeline that we can establish for um, kind of workers for at our factory, for uh, kind of designers at our headquarters, uh, currently in El Segundo, California? Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, to to uh, invest in those communities. Uh, and to really make people more aware that this new wave of nuclear needs not only one specific set of skills, uh, but really, you know, construction skills, uh, you know, project management. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot to do uh, and a lot that's necessary. I imagine Pam that Whirlpool thought about those same things, and now it's become established part of the community, right? right, uh, right. Around you know the, the factories in your. I think you said nine states. Uh, we have 10 factories across six states. Six states, sorry. Yeah. I was kind of there. Yeah, you were very close. Close, close on great. both numbers. Yeah. But it is all about what can you develop around that space in order and stay embedded for a very long yeah. time. Uh, a question, for, oh, we have a bunch of questions. We can really only get to one. I saw you first, um, but you already asked a question today. So I'm going to go to you because I saw you second. So uh, if, we, if, we, if he's asked a very quick question, I can come back to you, but... We do have another. We have one more panel. I'll try to be quick. Uh, hi, Patrick McCown. I'm with a representative of German Industry and Trade here in D.C. Uh, I just have a question on sort of uh, apprenticeship programs in general. We've seen more industry-led initiatives under Republican administrations. We've seen more sort of national DOA-led initiatives uh, under Democrats. And the question would be, how do you think of those? Um, how do you make sure clean tech is a part of that? And what do you think about more comprehensive nationwide approaches that could help foster the cultural change we need to you know, get people into more in apprenticeships and not just into universities. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think that's for everyone. So any uh, thoughts in response to the question? Thank you. I'll maybe take this first one. It's just I think we've seen nuclear as a really bipartisan issue recently. And so I think we'll continue to get uh, support. Um, and I think uh, what's important about kind of this engagement uh, on a national scale, I think it is imperative for all the nuclear companies to really come together and kind of build this one voice, kind of one message about how far the industry has produced or has progressed. Uh, but we also look at the NRC as well uh, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as also having some responsibility of showing how safe uh, these uh, uh, kind of the new technology is. And so as the NRC continues to modernize and as it approves uh, different reactor designs, then I think we'll see kind of the messaging uh, around nuclear shift uh, as well. Dennis, and then please feel free to others. Yeah, to sure. Um, well, I mentioned you know community colleges and and, and um, career technology education as being important, but um, I think from a workforce standpoint, again, making all of us ambassadors for our industries, 
you know, where we articulate our whys. You know, why, why is this a great career, what it, whatever you're talking about? You know, why, why, is, um, why people should be interested in our work, right? Why, why should it be interested? That's what it's going to take to convince the guidance counselors and the advisors and, and the parents to talk about this. And then finally, you know, why, why is our fields, our fields, um, essential for the survival of our, our you know, our planet and, and protecting our globe. And uh, by making that case and all of us being able to think about that and talk about our careers and why someone should be interested in the careers we've chosen and put our life's work into and, and why a, a younger person uh, shouldn't be interested in that and feel like they could have an impact and, and make a great career. And I, I really focus on casting a wider net. It doesn't matter whether you're from engineering school. You could be from biology. You could be from chemistry. You could be from technology um, or technicians and, and grow your way through a career that would have a tremendous impact and help us meet these goals. Without people, we're not going to meet any of these goals we're talking about today. And people committed to stick with it. For, a, for an entire career. Pam Sapna, any additional thoughts? Yeah, I would just add one area. We've had successes working with those technical schools, either for programs to kids that are in high school and, and, and even entering that technical school after high school on their marketing, if you will, and their messaging and making it okay um, to choose those fields and, and actually being proud uh, to choose that over maybe what everyone assumes is, is college is next or armed forces is next. So helping them tell their message in a little uh, stronger way and partnering through those institutions who have that expertise for the programming. And I'll echo um, similar to what we've already said. I think we need to work at the policy level, at the federal level. So the IRA, the IAJ has included funding around workforce, making sure there's training programs, apprenticeship programs as well. Um, but we also need to work at the industry and the nonprofit and the uh, programmatic level. So similar to what we have in the Empowered Schools program or the HBCUs program, making sure that we're working on the ground up as well to make sure the industries and the folks within the K-12 school districts or even before and after understand better what the opportunities are thank you very much uh, is it okay is it okay so thank you for that um, this was an awesome discussion uh, Dennis Pam Sapna and Brees thank you for joining us today it was a really great panel <laughs>